So good evening, friends, to the Jesuit Institute here in South Africa. We are on our fourth session of reading the Gospel of Mark again. I am Father David, and I'm very pleased to be with you on this Human Rights Day in South Africa. I remind you that there is a time for questions and discussion in the last 15 minutes of our hour together. And I remind you that the way that we do that is that you write your questions into the chat and you can do that while we are going through our class so that you don't forget what you want to ask. And so let us begin as usual with the time of prayer we will hear the Teze hymn as we have done in the past. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So as we begin, once again, I remind you, as I have through all these weeks, we are reading together a late first century text in Greek that is very strongly based on the sacred scriptures of Israel, what we Christians call the Old Testament, a carefully composed work where each word has been chosen with great care. It's a work of literature, a work of spirituality, a work talking about God, thus theology, and certainly there is a basis in history. 
We are reading the first of the four books of the gospel we find in the New Testament, according to most exegetes, indeed the first, the first one written. And it is written after St. Paul wrote his epistles, and I have maintained throughout and will continue to maintain, it is strongly influenced by the theology of Paul, and most exegetes agree that the book we are reading is a basis for the writings of St. Matthew and St. Luke. Also, we have been looking from week to week as our progression. We haven't progressed a great deal because we are reading very slowly and carefully. We spent the first week studying the title and then we did, dealt with the opening and we began this introduction that perhaps today we will conclude. No promises made. Let's look once again at the structure of this introduction that focuses on two geographical loci, John the Baptist, baptizing in the Jordan, then Jesus' own baptism at the hands of John. Those are the two texts we have already studied. Today, we will look at closely the text of the temptation and perhaps reach the finale, Jesus going off to Galilee. Let's read again quickly the text that we are dealing with in its entirety so that we can put the small text we'll be dealing with today, verses 12 and 13 first, within the context of Mark 1, 4 to 15. So I read it again. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was close I don't, that attitude is a belt a around his waist. It is a very destructive behavior to learn. Could somebody please turn off the sound? Ah, thank you. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out of the wilderness. He was in the, out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As I pointed out, we will now dive into a very close reading of verses 12 and 13, the verses that we call the temptations of Jesus. Please notice that there is a link between the two parts of the one text, on the one hand, the baptism, on the other, the temptations, written as a closely woven together text. The, temp the baptism, and just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And then... Two verses later, and the spirit, the same spirit, immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Please notice that in between these two verses is the center 
the proclamation, you are my son, God the Father, again calling out to the son, as God had done with Adam, as God had done with Israel, will this son be different? This perhaps is the central question as we now focus on the text that we will study to today in detail. And I read it again, sorry to be so repetitive, but we know the value of repeating, of letting it really sink in. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. The spirit drove him out, threw him out. There is a violence there that needs to be heard, a violence that is even more underlined when we realize that in the parallel text in Matthew and in Luke, the parallel description of the temptations, both of those writers, Matthew and Luke, do not use this violent verb drove. They write, he was led out by the spirit. But Mark here is echoing, echoing the driving out of Adam from the garden. For we are again dealing with, is this Jesus going to be somebody different from the son that was Adam, the son that is Israel. And at the end of chapter three in the book of Genesis, we have the same verb used. He drove out the man, God. He drove out the man from the garden. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. So that verb is evoking something from the Old Testament that reminds us that Adam, the first man, lost that intimacy with God. Is Jesus going to retain it? Adam had it and lost it. Will Jesus keep it? By the way, this verb also prepares us for actions that Jesus will carry out and just two places. I have underlined here where Mark again uses the same verb. The verb in Greek is ekbalo, which again means to throw out or to drive out. This will be part of Jesus's mission. And the verb is used numerous times. I've just given two examples here. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out. This is Jesus casting out. Jesus is cast out or driven out by the spirit to the same place where we are, that place of wilderness. But Jesus, in bringing us back into the garden, will drive out the demons that beset us. And in Mark 3.23, again, the use of the same verb, and he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. These are those who are accusing him that it's by Satan that he drives out the demons. And he says, how can Satan drive out Satan? But we will come to that much later. What is important, of course, is the place into which Jesus is driven out, the wilderness. Repeated in the text, he is in the wilderness. The wilderness in biblical geography is the opposite of garden, the opposite of land. We talked about it briefly when we talked about God, out of the nothingness of wilderness, creates the conditions for life. For in the wilderness, there are no conditions for life. I evoke here again the Adam story. For when Adam has contravened the commandment of God, chosen to listen to Satan, the snake, and not to the voice of God, a consequence of that is the reversal of the creation process that led to the garden. And so we read there in chapter 3, 17 and 18 in the book of Genesis, the consequence of Adam's contravention of the law, the word, the created word of life. 
It's written, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Again, a description of the sweat that is needed in order to bring forth food from a wilderness, which is the opposite to the garden. We can think as well when we think of wilderness, of the people refusing to go into the land in the book of Numbers. They've reached the border after the 11 days that it took them to walk from Sinai to the borders of the land in Kadesh Barnea, 11 days. They now are awaiting the report of the spies Moses sends into the land. And the spies bring back a mixed report. Ten say it's a fearful land. There are giants and in their eyes, we look like grasshoppers. And two, only two say, if God is with us, who can be against us? Remember that one of those two is Jesus. Oh, sorry, I'm speaking Greek. Joshua in Hebrew, Jesus in Greek. Jesus, the son of Nun, who says with Caleb, we can do it because God is with us. But the people listen to the ten and are doomed to wander the wilderness for an entire generation. Another 38 years, making 40 years in the wilderness, years of wilderness and death. And this is the consequence of their refusal to believe that they can do it. Your dead bodies shall fall in this very wilderness and of all your number included in the census from 20 years old and upward who have complained against me according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days for every day a year, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. So again, wilderness, again, wilderness and not land. Or in the book of Deuteronomy, remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you testing you to know what is in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. A reminder that those 40 years in the wilderness were the consequence of not living by faith in God. In Jeremiah chapter 4, 23 to 26, again, a wilderness experience, which is the exile, but Jeremiah sees it as a cosmic catastrophe. Jeremiah writes, I looked on the earth and lo, it was waste and void. The tohu and vohu repeated here. The only other text that has that expression from Genesis 1-2. Tohu vavohu, the wilderness out of which God has made everything, has reverted to wilderness as Jerusalem is destroyed. And to the heavens and they had no light. I looked on the mountains and lo, they were quaking and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked and lo, there was no one at all and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, a wilderness and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. Again, Jesus is thrown into this place it's the place where we are in exile from the garden, in exile from the land, for we have embraced a false word and not the word of life. Of course, the 40 days, 40 years we heard about, but let's remember that there are 40 days. He was there. This is Moses up on Sinai with the Lord, 40 days and 40 nights. And then Exodus has something that is not mentioned in the Martin text. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. I've added a little digression here, just so that we can remember that Matthew, who is faithfully rewriting Mark, but according to his own understanding, according to his own, his own icon, writes about the temptation, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. You can see that he's taking it straight from Exodus, broadening the Mark and description. 
and afterwards he was famished. So hopefully here we see the importance of the wilderness and the 40 days that Jesus spends there. And he's encountering Satan. Now, Satan is not a very, very developed character in the Old Testament. But we can certainly understand with a biblical understanding that Mark is probably thinking he has evoked over and over again Adam and creation and wilderness as a punishment or are rather, as I prefer, a consequence of bad choices. So I think first and foremost, we can remember the snake as it is written in Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. The serpent will succeed in drawing the human person away from the word of God. And the question now is, in encountering the serpent, Satan in the wilderness, will Satan draw Jesus away from the word that Jesus has heard? The word that said, you are my son. Now, the word Satan does appear in the Old Testament, and I'm not going to say too much about this, but Satan generally in the Old Testament is not an evil character, not the master of evil, but rather the protector, the protector of God's honor. The one who says to God, don't trust too much these human characters. They are not faithful. And so we encounter Satan in the last chapter of the first book of Chronicles. Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to count the people of Israel. That means David did not trust. He wanted to count the people to be sure of his strength. Or in Job, the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. I'm sure you'll all remember how that story continues when God says to Satan, did you see Job, my pride and joy? And Satan will say to God, no wonder he's your pride and joy. No wonder he's your pride and joy. You've just blessed him with so much. Take it away and he will curse you. And so begins a very difficult story as Job sinks into deep suffering and remains faithful to God, showing that Satan is wrong. But in a very late book of the Old Testament that is only in our Catholic Bibles, not in the Jewish canon or in the Protestant one, we do already have the idea of a Satan that we know through the Christian tradition as well. In the book of the Wisdom of Solomon, through the devil's envy, death entered the world and those who belong to his company experience it. Now, let's go back a moment so that we do not lose track of the text that we're looking at. The spirit has driven Jesus out into the wilderness and the wilderness is where we are, a wilderness that is not land and not garden, but a consequence of not listening to God's word so that we are custodians of creation. And Jesus spends their 40 days tempted as we are tempted. Now notice Mark, very different from Luke and Matthew, does not give any details about what goes on. That will be Matthew and Luke will have a, a whole dialogue. But the text continues in Mark, and it's a little enigmatic. He was tempted by Satan, and I presume then he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. And I think, again, if we are not familiar with those threads that Mark is weaving together, those threads of the Old Testament, we might not exactly understand from Mark. What was the consequence? But I think that when we identify the texts, the consequences are clear. Jesus, unlike Adam, and quite different from a people of Israel that knows moments of fidelity and long periods of infidelity, Jesus has been faithful. 
And so he is with the wild animals and the angels wait on him. Let's read a text that will perhaps flesh this out. Isaiah chapter 11, an eschatological vision. The animals, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, you see, the animals have come together. And what is being described here is a reversal of the consequence of not listening to God in the garden. For, as a consequence to the disobedience, enmity enters creation. Enmity between the seed of woman and the seed of the snake. But enmity in every which way. Enmity between God and God's own children, humanity. Enmity among the children of God, particularly in that text between man and woman, and enmity with the rest of the creation. With Jesus' disobedience, this enmity has ended. It's true that we present even some of the saints as living with wild beasts, as Alta Christi, as other Christs, bringing back that element of peace, which is perfection in the creation. Let's look at another text, which perhaps also explains the idea of the angels serving Jesus. Psalm 8, a part of the psalm. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God, or in the Greek angels, and crowned them with glory and honor. Now, that might not be obvious, but how I'm reading it is, you made them, you created them just a little lower than God or as the Greek translates, God angels. And then, and then you crowned them with glory and honor, meaning then the angels served them. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas, all things under their feet. And I would suggest even the angels are there to serve God's children. Now you'll notice here something a little strange, perhaps for some, but I have been reading the Quran for about 40 years, more than 40 years, and finding that my understanding of biblical narrative, biblical terminology, is broadened by how Muslims understand some of the same narratives that we all share. And so I want to read something from Surat Al-Araf from the Quran, verse 11. God is telling the angels that they must bow down to the human creatures. And this is what it says. Surely we created you, then shaped you, then said to the angels, prostrate before Adam. The angels are being told to worship Adam. That's what you see in that little Persian miniature. So they all did, but not Iblis. Iblis is the Arabic Muslim name for Satan, who refused to prostrate with the others. In Arabic, lam yakun min sajidin. Ah, he did not bow down. What defines a Muslim is that a Muslim submits and bows down. 
Allah asked, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? And he, Iblis, Satan replied, I am better than he is. You created me from fire and him from clay. Again, Jesus has prevailed over Satan. And so he is with the wild beasts and the angels come to serve him. We have three fundamental moments in our biblical narrative. Creation, God as creator. God has created the human person and put the human person as the crown of creation. The human person is in a garden. But the human person does not stay faithful to the creative word. And this leads to a consequence of this disobedience is decreation, wilderness. Jesus has just heard the words, you are my son, a new creation, a new Adam. And he is taken to the place of decreation in solidarity with humanity that is all there and tempted like they are. Will he renege? Will he be like Adam? Will he be like those moments when the children of Israel did not believe? No. He will lead us into a recreation with the animals served by the angels. So brothers and sisters, we see here are uh, in this brief text, the introduction. We have not yet come to the end of it. We will in a moment. We see what is being evoked are the three central moments of the biblical narrative in the Old Testament. Creation, which is blessing. God blesses, pours out blessing on the human person and on all of creation, where the human person is called to be a custodian, keeping creative order. But we know that through disobedience, the human person listens to other voices. The serpent sneaks in and whispers into the ear of the human person that the human person does not need God, that the human person can be the human person's own parent, own creator, and so creation sinks into decreation. But God does not give up. And God sends Jesus into the world, God's own son, and Jesus' obedience will lead to recreation, the garden, land, new life. This is the story that Mark is going to tell. But we're still right at the beginning. So let's read the final part of the text. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Let's look very carefully at those words that Jesus says. These words will be the central message of what Mark has called the beginning of the good news. The time is fulfilled. Now is the time. And the kingdom of God has come near. That expression, kingdom of God, is an echo of the central message of the Old Testament. God can come as king when we form his kingdom on earth. This kingdom is now near, nearer than near in Jesus, the obedient son the one who looks to his father and sees a king. So the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, taking up again the message of John, as we'll see, see in a moment, and believe, not like Adam, not like very often in Israel's history, Israel, in the good news. I want to focus on two words here, two particularly Markan words. The first is translated in our text, arrested. Now, after John was arrested, 
The word is paradidomi, and I would prefer a translation that says, after John was handed over. That's what paradidomi means very literally. He was handed over. We'll look at that word. <clears throat> and then I want to look again at the word good news. We've looked at that already. It was in the title, you remember? The beginning of the good news. So first of all, paradidomi. <clears throat> We just see John <clears throat> was handed over. And it should remind us that John is the one who runs before Jesus, runs before Jesus in life and in death. When we have a list of disciples for the first time, the 12 in chapter 3, the last disciple will be named as Judas Iscariot. And in our translation of the New Revised Standard Version, it's written, who betrayed him. But please notice, it's the same word, who handed him over. Paradidomi. In chapter 7, when we get there, we will be reading a long speech of Jesus about tradition. The problem with tradition. And there we read, you abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Tradition can become a handing over in a negative sense. Tradition, of course, means a handing over or a handing down, but tradition can become a betrayal, a handing over, negative. And when we come to that text, we'll deal more with that. But let's go on and see other forms of this same verb used throughout the text in 1033, the second, uh, sorry, the third uh, prophecy of Jesus's passion, death and resurrection. He says, see, we are going to Jerusalem and the son of man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. Okay, please notice here we have three different agents of handing over. We have Judas, the disciple. Then we have the people handing him over to the chief priests and scribes. Those are the policemen that they've sent. And then he will be handed over to the Gentiles. Everyone hands Jesus over. 1410, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to hand him over to them. 1418, Jesus said, truly I tell you, one of you will hand me over, one who is eating with me. 1441, Gethsemane, the hour has come, the Son of Man is handed over into the hands of sinners. 151, as soon as it was, was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. And finally, so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. This verb, which we've just encountered for the first time in the handing over of John, will accompany the narrative of Jesus from beginning to end. And the good news, we remember, uh, the good news. What is the good news? And again, a very strong echo of the book of Isaiah. Some of these verses we've read, some we didn't. Let's read all of them. The good news in the book of Isaiah, and we'll ask what that good news is. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here is your God. Jerusalem, standing on the high mountain, that is the Mount of Olives, and looking to the east, is seeing Israel, the people of God risen from the dead, emerging from the tomb of the exile in Babylon, and coming back to Jerusalem to build the city and the temple. This is the good news, the good news of resurrection. 
In Isaiah 41, 27, the writer continues, I first have declared it to Zion, and I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news. And in 52, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Notice, kingdom of God, good news, new life. Or in Isaiah 60, a text we read on the Feast of the Epiphany, a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the good news of the praise of the Lord. For in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. And we all recognize there a text that Jesus in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4 reads in the synagogue of Nazareth as he says, today this text is fulfilled in me. Again, good news. Jesus is proclaiming good news. Now, finally, as we end our study today, let us look at this finale that we just read. Now, after John was arrested, the bottom of the screen. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Please notice by referring to the first text we read in this introduction, the text about John, that we have here an inclusion. Now, after John was arrested, the text began, John the baptizer appeared. He proclaimed, but now Jesus is doing the proclaiming. Notice the difference in what he proclaimed, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is proclaiming good news. John was preparing for Jesus' coming, and now he has come. And Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The time is now. John is the end of a whole epoch stretching back all the way to Abraham, a time to prepare for the coming of the one who has now come. Now the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. And I do want to say once again, this idea of kingdom is central to the Old Testament. And I will mention just one text. As Catholics, we sing this text on Saturday morning. It is the text of the people coming out of Egypt, crossing the sea, born in blood and water. The people crossing the sea, a newborn, learns the song of Moses. Yes, indeed, that song begins with proclaiming the greatness of God, that God, who is a king greater than Pharaoh, has thrown Pharaoh's army into the sea. But right at the end, in Exodus Chapter 15, the end of the song, I think it's verse 19, 18 or 19. The verse says, and God is our king forever. This is the sign of Israel, the sign of the people of God, that they seek no other king but God, and that when they live according to the word of that king, are obedient to God's holy word, then God reigns. The kingdom of God has come. And so Jesus, in complete continuity with these scriptures, in the language of John, is saying the kingdom of God has come near. Indeed. Sorry, we had another technical issue. And we can now begin okay. the question section or the queries. So... Uh, Again, I see the chat box is empty, but I'm sure, no, there we are. 
Thank you, from Stephen. Uh, if Ursula is there, perhaps she can help us with the questions. Or Gillian. Uh, yes, I'm here. Ursula. Okay. Are you able to so hear Ursula, me? The first question. Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Okay. The first question from Stephen is, Mark's audience must have been steeped in the Old Testament in order to grasp all of these references. Who were they? Okay, that is an excellent question, and it needs to be a slightly complex answer. So I'd say a few points. One, let's remember that people at that time didn't have libraries or books to read. So if people were familiar with literature, if their language was enriched by literature, it would be what we have come to regard as sacred scripture. Very often known by heart very often being the language that is employed in daily life to refer to God, to the human person, and to the relationship between them. So again, yes, for us, it's very difficult to make all these connections because we know too much. We read too widely. We're reading Shakespeare and Ernest Hemingway and Alan Payton and God knows what else. We're reading many, many things, and that's wonderful. It enriches our human experience, but it does make the biblical texts much harder to read in depth because they don't evoke as much as they would for someone living in Mark's world. Now the question, who is Mark writing for? I think that there is no doubt that Mark is writing for an audience that is made up of Jews and non-Jews. So immediately someone might say, but then the non-Jews would not understand all of these scriptural references. And I do want to point out that we do know from descriptions of early Christian kerygma that there was a great insistence that those joining the church would also become familiar with the scriptures of the people of Israel. We know that this will lead to a major explosion in the middle of the second century when one of the thinkers in the church, the son of a bishop, his name was Marcion, will come and say, we don't need all of those scriptures. And the church fathers, those who provide us with a basic language of Christianity, will immediately realize that the danger of giving up on the scriptures of Israel is the danger of becoming illiterate, incapable of actually uh, understanding the message of Jesus and the message of those recording Jesus. So the Old Testament will, in stages, become the holy scriptures of the church, together with those scriptures that talk about Jesus. Um, there's a question from Don who asks, what exactly is the good news that the prophets and Jesus were proclaiming? Okay, so I would say that there is a very simple answer to that. Okay, the good news is resurrection. In other words, let's flesh that out just a little. Death is not the end of the story. Okay. Let's flesh that out a little more now in the Old Testament context. I would say that that is the central experience of the life of the people of Israel. Death is not the last word. And when was that experienced? In the exile and the return from exile. Okay, I think that many exegetes today propose that the scriptures are born as holy scriptures, as a witness to the acti activity of God in the 6th century BC. And what is the 6th century BC? The 6th century BC is the century that brings together the catastrophe of the Babylonian invasion, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the burial of the people in the tomb of exile. At the same time, it has in the around the year 539 the miraculous opening of the tomb by the person Isaiah calls the Messiah of God, 
who is that? Cyrus, king of Persia, who allows the people to return to the land. Okay, again, I would say that in the Old Testament, the good news that is being referred to repeatedly by Isaiah is that good news. Death has been conquered. Okay, that, of course, is preparation then for what we have in the New Testament when the tomb on that Sunday morning is discovered to be empty and the disciples begin to experience Jesus as raised from the dead. This is the epicenter of the good news, that God is a God of life and God will not allow death to be the last word. Um, there's a question from, or a uh, comment from Ensley. She says, you said that John the Baptist was the end of an epoch. Earlier in church history, there was the idea that Christianity replaced Judaism. Can you say how you understand and see this? Can God give up on his sons? So I would say that absolutely it's not the end. Okay. Um, in the Second Vatican Council, uh, we retrieved an incredible saying of St. Paul to lead us on a new reflection on our relationship with the Jewish people, and that is God does not, does not annul God's promises. God does not annul God's, God's covenant. So, no, when I said the end of an epoch, I'm talking about John uh, ref, uh, um, preparing for the coming of this messianic figure who is Jesus. Of course, this is not the place we can organize, perhaps through the Jesuit Institute, another series that talks about the church's new thinking about our relationship with the Jewish people. Okay, but when I said the end of an epoch, I'm talking rather about our canonization of the scriptures of Israel, where we end, and this is different from how the Jewish people canonize the same scriptures, we end with the promise at the end of the book of Malachi of here, Elijah is coming to announce the day of the Lord. And in that sense, ah, again, it's a Christian understanding or a Jewish Christian understanding in the New Testament, that when we turn over the page from the end of the book of Malachi, we open up into the encounter with John the Baptist, who is being described very clearly in this text we just read as an Elijah figure, dressed like Elijah, doing what Elijah does at the very place where Elijah went up to heaven. And he's saying, now the day of the Lord has come. And so when I say the end of an epoch, it's the epoch preparing for the day of the Lord. And here we have the dawning of the day of the Lord. There are no other questions. I don't know if anybody else wants to add a comment or whatever, uh, or a question in the, in the chat. Just to remind everybody, as Gillian has put there, uh, that tonight's recording, as well as all the previous talks, are available on the YouTube uh, channel of the Jesuit Institute. Uh, there's a playlist called Read Mark Again, and they're all available there. No, no more questions. Oh, if there are no more questions, we can end, Ursula. I think that would be perfectly legitimate, but just perhaps a word about where we are going. Okay, we have finished um, the title. We spent a long time on the title. We spent a long time on that tapestry of uh, citations from the scriptures of Israel that gives us a language with which to understand what Mark is doing, and we've just finished the introduction. Next week, we will march into a section that I think that we can call the first day of power. Jesus emerges as this very powerful figure who is able, able to do whatever he sets his mind to do. Interesting, I pointed out now, and we'll go into detail next week, that is not the center of the story of Mark. Never forget what we discussed last week, the canotic process. There is an emptying of that power, but we want to experience it next week. Okay, 
Ursula, I think there was finally a question that suddenly popped on the screen just as I was speaking. Yes. Uh, Don asks, is it possible that when Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted, that he knew about how his mission would end? <laughs> so again, these questions are very legitimate questions. There are questions about Jesus's consciousness and how it developed. I am not 100% convinced, and you can challenge me on this all the time, that this is a focus of Mark. Remember, Mark is not so much writing the biography of Jesus as he's proclaiming to a community who believe in Jesus who Jesus is. Okay, again, let me say that to make it 100% clear. A biographer would necessarily be concerned with how do the ideas of the person that we are writing the biography of develop? How does that person come to a consciousness of self? How does that person relate to his or her parents, his or her disciples from an internal per perspective? That's a biography. Gospel is not a biography. Gospel is the proclamation of a figure in whom I believe and who I want to share with you. In other words, the focus is not on the internal processes that are going on in Jesus's head, but rather on the person who is believing in Jesus and making Jesus a part of that person's life. Again, this might not be 100% clear at the outset, but I do ask you to continue asking these questions that seem to come up every week about Jesus's consciousness, what's going on in Jesus's head. And I will come back and try to point out that perhaps in reading the gospel, the person at the center of the evangelist's concern is you, the reader. Are you following Jesus? Are you listening to Jesus? Are you entering into a process that will nurture an intimate relationship with Jesus? That is the gospel. That is the proclamation of the good news. A life of Jesus, as people started to write in the late 18th century through the 19th century until today, is a very different genre, very interesting genre, very helpful genre. But that's not what we're going to find in the four books of the New Testament, uh, the four books called Gospel. So thank you very much. I hope that we'll meet again next week. Perhaps next week, we'll have a week free of technical problems. That will be certainly an answer to one of my prayers. So have a very good night and see you next week.